We just finished our section where we were solving the different types of equations that we should be uh, used to uh, solving out in this prerequisite chapter. Uh, now we're looking at solving out equations within word problems, modeling with equations. Uh, so the learning objective for this section is pretty simple. It's forming equations and then solving those equations to solve application problems. Uh, whenever we're problem solving with equations, uh, we have to remember that we're going to have to model the information given in the problem with equations. A model is a mathematical representation of a real world situation. We obtain models by translating from ordinary language of English into the algebra uh, and to the algebra required in order to solve the equations. Now, strategy for solving word problems. And sometimes students just breeze right past this and then when they get to a problem, they're like, oh, where do I start? So where you start is you do have to read the problem carefully to make sure you understand what's going on, most notably what to call X in the problem. It will probably be putting other terms in in, in with respect to something in the problem, like if it says the length is twice the width, I would let my width be x and the length is going to be 2x. So whatever's put in terms of another uh, thing in the problem, that uh, independent variable needs to be the x term. And we'll see that in the examples. For step two, if necessary, write expressions for other unknown quantities in the problem in terms of x. So preferably we would always want to put everything in terms of x. You don't want to call one x, one y, and one z. That's not beneficial at all. If at all possible, put everything in terms of x. Uh, write an equation in x that models the verbal conditions of the problem. And then of course, just as we did in the last section, we'll solve that equation using our techniques that we have up to this point. And then we can check the solution. And uh, this book is big about making sure you check the solution in the original wording of the problem, uh, just to make sure that your answer is correct. Okay, so look at our first problem here. We have four examples to get you accustomed to working the problems in this section. The first one here, it says, the median starting salary of a computer science major exceeds that of an education major by 21,000. And, and this is actual valid data too. This isn't just throwing it at you, this is valid data. So meeting the median starting salary exceeds an education major by 21,000. Median starting salary of an economics major exceeds that of an education major by 14,000. Combined, their median starting salaries are 140,000. We're supposed to determine the median starting salaries of education majors, computer science majors, and economics majors with bachelor's degree. So once they get their bachelor's degree and go off to get their very first job, what does each one of these majors expect to make uh, uh, as far as the median uh, income? Now, First thing you should be looking at in this problem is what to call X. And that's a very, very easy choice because please notice it put the computer science major's income in terms of the education major. It put the economics major's income in terms of the education major. So everything is with respect to how much the education major makes. So without a doubt, I'm letting X equal the median starting salary of an education major. Now the other quantities in the problem become really easy. I know it said the computer science major makes 21,000 more. X is measured in thousands in this problem. So I can say X plus 21 is gonna equal the median starting salary of a computer science major. And then the economics majors made 14,000 more. So X plus 14 would represent that. Now. We also know in the problem that it said that combined their median starting salaries are 140,000. That's where I got this equation from right here. So X is representing the education major. X plus 21 is representing the computer science major. X plus 14 is representing the economics major. The sum of their starting salaries would equal 140,000. So I just said equals 140. That allows me a nice equation that I can simplify. I collect my X terms and I get 3X. 21 plus 14 gives me 35. 
I get the X term by itself by subtracting 35 on both sides. So 3X is equal to 105. We divide by 3. 105 divided by 3 is going to give me 35. So what this tells me is that X is 35. The computer science major that's represented by X plus 21 is 56. And the economics major, X plus 14, 35 plus 14 is 49. Now, put, putting that back in terms of the problem, what I know is that X, which represented the education major being 35, tells me that the median starting salary of an education major is 35,000. The median starting salary of the computer science major is 21,000 more or 56,000. And the median starting salary of the economics major was $14,000 more or 49,000 here. Now to check this problem, all you would have to do is understand that, well, I could add these three incomes and it better total 140,000 and it does. So using the median uh, starting salaries from that, that we just got in the previous step, if you add 35,000 plus 56,000, plus 56,000 plus 49,000, you're going to get 140,000, which that just verifies that we've done the problem correctly. Now again, if you don't want to do the step five part and check your answer, you don't have to, uh, but it might be good to in some, in some cases. I, myself, I would prefer not to in this one. Uh, up next, uh, after a 30% price reduction, you purchase a new computer for $840. What was the computer's price before the reduction? So we, we know it was more expensive before it had this 30% reduction. Now, again, you're supposed to be thinking about what do I call X in the problem? Well, it's very clear. What was the computer's price before the reduction? Boom, that's my value of X. X equals the price before reduction. Now, I know that that price is being reduced by 30%. Well, that means it's losing 30% of its value. Please remember 30% as a decimal is 0.3. So I know that the price of the, that I paid for the new computer was the original price minus 30% of the original price minus 0.3x. So now I can easily write an equation x minus 0.3x is going to equal the price paid $840. Now, that allows me to solve for what the original price would have been. X minus 0.3X just gives me 0.7X. So we know we paid 70% of the original retail price for the computer. What was that original retail price? Well, in order to solve for X, you divide by 0.7 on both sides. 840 divided by 0.7 gives me 1200. Now I know that that tells me that the price of the computer before the reduction was $1,200. Now, again, if you wanted to check that, all you would have to do is take 1200 minus 0.3 times 1200, and you'll get the 840, which checks out uh, the original uh, goal of this problem. Uh, now, oh, and you can see I, I did that here. 1200 minus 30% of 1200 equals 1200 minus 0 0.3 times 1200. That's 1200. 0.3 times 1200 is 360 but 1200 minus 360 gives me the sales price of $840. And that's verifying that the original retail price of the computer's price was 1200. Uh, now, in example three, so we've looked at a problem in which we had how much uh, incomes were, then we looked at a problem as pricing on uh, uh, the sales price versus the original price, uh, so, so far we've been dealing with money, money. Now let's talk about area and geometry. It says the length of a regular basketball court is 44 feet more than its width. If the perimeter uh, of the basketball court is 288 feet, what are its dimensions? So I want to know both the length and the width. How do you know which one to call X? It should be a foregone conclusion which to call Please go back to the problem and notice it tells you the length of a rectangular basketball court is 44 feet more than the width. As soon as it's telling me the length in terms of the width, that tells me the width needs to be my independent variable x. And then the length can just be that variable plus 44. 
that's the logic I did right here. I said, well, let's just let X equal the width of the basketball court. And then it says the length is 44 more than that. So X plus 44 is the length of the basketball court. Now, what we know in order to find out those dimensions, we know the perimeter around the whole court is 288 feet. Well, the perimeter is going to be the sum of all sides. And since this is rectangular, I'm going to have two lengths and I'm gonna have two widths. So I can say the perimeter is gonna be twice the width, that's two X, plus twice the length, two times X plus 44. And I know that that has to equal 288. So now I'll go to the next page and I can say, well, then 2x plus 2 uh, times the group x plus 44 equals 288. We distribute the 2 through that second group and we'll get 2x plus 88. Uh, in the next step, I just gathered my terms of x. I'll get 4x plus 88 equals 288. Clearly, we can eliminate those 88s by subtracting 88 on both sides. And that's going to lead us to the 4x equals 200 and divide by four for the x equals 50. Now, please remember this was the uh, width of the basketball court in feet. So I can say, well, now, okay, then I know the width of the basketball court is gonna be 50 feet. Uh, and, and it asks for both dimensions. So the length, we know it's 44 feet more than what the width was. It's gonna be 94 feet. So then I can easily say, well, yeah, the dimensions of the basketball court, it's 50 foot by 94 foot. Now for the next problem, or sorry, for the next part of this problem, and this is the part that I would not require, but if you wanted to, you could check it. You could say, well, go back and check to make sure that works. We know the perimeter has to be 288. So we know two times the width plus two times the length our answer for width and length can go right here, 50 and 94. That should equal 288. Well, two times 50 is 100. Two times 94 is gonna be 188. 100 plus 188, 288. And that's great because it verifies that our problem is correct. Uh, now, the last type of problem that we'll be looking at in this section, we'll look at triangles and the Pythagorean theorem. You should be very, very, very familiar with this where we say uh, within any right triangle, the legs, which are always adjacent to the right triangle, can be called A and B, and the hypotenuse C is always opposite the right angle. The proportion of the length of the sides of the legs to the hypotenuse can be resulted by this equation. The, square, the sum of the squares of the legs is equal to the square of the hypotenuse, or a squared plus B squared is equal to the hypotenuse C squared. Now, using that in order to work out some problems, uh, you'll be given something like this in your homework, where you say uh, you have this radio tower that's supported by two guy wires uh, that are 130 yards long and attached to the ground 50 uh, yards from the base of the tower. And then asking, and then you're asked, how tall is the tower? No problem. You can just say, well, okay, I know that the tower has to be assumed to be built, and you don't even have to assume it because it's in your drawing here, but otherwise you could assume, hey, I bet that tower is built straight up. <laughs> it should be. Uh, it's not the leaning tower of Pisa. Uh, so I can say, well, that tower is not leaning, so it should be built at a right angle. So then the side opposite that right angle is the length of the wire. That's my hypotenuse of the triangle. I'm given the base of the triangle, how far the wire is located out. So I should be able to find the height of that tower by just saying A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared, or 50 squared plus X squared is equal to 130 squared. You'll see that's what I did on the next page, where all I've done is I've let X model the height of that tower, and you really didn't even have to talk about it here because it's labeled in your picture as the height of the tower. X squared plus 50 squared equals 130 squared. And then I can say, well, okay, X squared plus 50 squared. 50 squared is 2,500. 130 squared, and I don't even need a calculator, nor should you for this. You just say, hey, 13 squared is 169, and then there's going to be two zeros after it. Yep, 130 squared is going to be 16,900. 169 with two zeros after it. Same thing with the 50 squared, you know, five times five is 25, and then there's gonna be two zeros after it. 
So X squared plus 2,500 is equal to 16,900. 16,900 minus 2,500 is going to be 1,440. I know that the square root of 144 is 12, and the square root of 100 is 10. This is going to be 12 times 10, 120. So please notice here I said X squared is equal to uh, 14,400. X is going to be the square root of 14,400, which if you do it the cool way like I did, you would know it's 120. Uh, but you could, of course, also use your calculator there. Now, technically, you would also say X is the positive negative root but we're just going to quickly and easily ignore that negative because that power is not a negative height that makes no sense in this problem. So right now you could temporarily say it's the positive negative value of 120, but then since X represents the height of the tower, the measurement has to be positive. We reject the negative 120 because it makes no sense within the context of this problem. Uh, thus, the height of the tower is 120 yards. Uh, and then uh, going back and checking that within the problem, uh, it says this can be checked using the converse of the Pythagorean theorem. If a triangle has sides of length A, B, and C, where C is the length of the longest side, and if A squared plus B squared is C squared, which it does, then the triangle is a right triangle. Okay, so 120 squared plus 50 squared is equal to a 130 squared. Well, 120 squared is my 144,000, oh, sorry, 14,400, not 144,000, 14,400. 50 squared is my 2,500. And as we've already looked at, 130 squared is going to be uh, 16,900. Well, the left hand side would sum to be the right hand side. So that's telling you that yes, this is a true statement, which means the solution of the height of the tower being 120 has to be correct, thus the height of the tower is 120 yards. That whole checking part, if you're not fond of that, you don't have to do that. I'll never require it. It's just something you can do just to make sure you don't make any errors in your problem. All right, that satisfies this section. Please do go ahead and try the wonderful uh, application problems within this section. You'll see problems just like each one of those four I just worked. Uh, if you've run into any trouble, let me know. Uh, hopefully you'll look at the problems I worked out of the book. Uh, they were quite fun problems, uh, although this is a very short section. There's not much to it. All right, guys, have fun trying the problems, and I'll see you next time.